preppers in the first century? Welcome to another episode of Bible Tidbits powered by LifeWord. Today we're finishing a six-part mini-series that will look at the six groups that form between the Old and the New Testaments, five of which are mentioned in the Gospels and in Acts. Here they are, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Zealots, the Sicarii, and now the Essenes. That's what we're covering today. Now, if you've never heard of the Essenes, there's a pretty good reason why. They're never directly mentioned in the Bible. I say directly because there's a place where I think Paul could be mentioning them in one of his letters, but we'll get to that in just a second. Now, you might be thinking, um, if the Essenes aren't in the Bible, then why are we talking about them? Good question. Here's why. First, they were a major sect of Judaism during the time of Jesus and while the New Testament was being written. Second, the Essenes have seen a resurgence in relevance since an archaeological discovery in the late 1940s. More on that later. During the first century, the Essenes numbered about 4,000 at the very most, by far smaller than the number of Sadducees and Pharisees. As for their name, we don't know why the Essenes were called Essenes exactly. Now, they most likely didn't call themselves this. This was a name that they were given. Now, after looking through everyone's speculations, this is what I think is the most plausible explanation. My best guess is because Philo, a historian from Alexandria, called them Essenes a derivative of the Greek word for reverent. All we know about the Essenes comes from three historians, Pliny the Elder, who died during a rescue mission to Pompeii after Mount Vesuvius erupted, hashtag history connections, Philo of Alexander, we mentioned him just a second ago, and Flavius Josephus, the historian we have mentioned many times throughout this miniseries, which I have to say, doesn't Flavius Josephus sound like a rapper name? So what made the Essenes different from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the two other big religious sects? First, the Essenes were more strict than the Pharisees when it came to the law. Some groups of Essenes even forbade marriage. But unlike Pharisees who went to the temple and participated in civic life, the Essenes refused to participate in temple activities and even created their own system of priests to protest the corruption of the temple by the Sadducees. Now, this did not make them friends with the Pharisees nor the Sadducees, but that doesn't matter because the Essenes lived in isolated communities all to themselves, not wanting any outside filth to stain their piety. These isolated communities are what we would call communes today, with all the property belonging to the group, not to individuals, a strong focus on manual labor, and a pacifistic lifestyle. Though some Essenes did live in remote, isolated communities like Qumran, Hold on to that, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Most Essenes lived in isolated communities inside of major metropolitan areas like Alexandria and Jerusalem. Now, anytime a group of people isolate themselves from the world, they get weird. That's just facts. The Essenes, in addition to some of their strange practices like wearing only white clothes and insisting on strict denials of all forms of pleasure, they also had some wonky beliefs. First, they rejected the idea of a physical resurrection because our physical bodies, not our spirits, are innately evil. Therefore, they believed in a spirit-only afterlife. Second, many Essene communities thought it was immoral to eat meat, even though God said meat is given to mankind as food in Genesis 9.3. Third, they believed that they were the only true remnant of God worshipers, and though they were pacifists, they were constantly prepping for a final war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness to be waged when two, maybe three messiahs finally arrived on the scene. Now, where did they get all of this? Well, that leads me to the final wonky belief. They believed that God sent them special angels to give them new revelations from God, leading them to not only have scripture beyond what you and I would call the Old Testament, but also to engage in angel worship, something expressly forbidden multiple times in scripture. It's all of these wonky beliefs that lead me to believe that Paul was talking about them in his letter to the Colossian church. He said in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. That last part destroys the physical bodies are bad argument. In verse 16, he says, Don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. 
That's debunking the no meat policy. Verse 17 talks about how everything points to the fact that Jesus is the Christ alone. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah, eliminating the argument for two or three Messiahs yet to come. In verse 18, don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worshiping of angels, saying that they've had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. Two things here. One, we don't have to deny ourselves pleasures that aren't sinful just because they're pleasurable. And two, never worship angels. Worship God alone. Now, to help you compare how all of these groups thought, I made this chart. Now, it looks like the political compass, but don't think of it as the same as the axes are different. The left axis is how politically active they were, and the bottom axis is how much they favored Jewish or Greek culture. Now, as you can see on the chart, the Essenes definitely favored Jewish culture and thought not only apolitically, but they could almost be considered anti-political as they simply disengaged from all life outside of their group. This is why they aren't mentioned in the New Testament. They isolated themselves out of relevance. The Essenes, they faded from existence in 70 AD as Jerusalem fell. It wasn't until the late 1940s that we began talking about the Essenes again because of a lost goat. You heard that right, a lost goat. A few years after World War II ended and a year before the nation of Israel was reestablished, an Arab shepherd named Muhammad was chasing a runaway goat when he picked up a rock tossed it into a cave, and heard a loud crack. After going in to investigate, he found that his rock had smashed a ceramic pot full of leather and papyrus scrolls. After major excavations by archaeologists, it was discovered that tens of thousands of scrolls were hidden in these caves, carefully preserving every single book of what you and I call the Old Testament, except for the book of Esther. These documents date one thousand years earlier than our previous copies and prove the preserved accuracy of the Old Testament throughout the millennia. If you think an entire video about the Dead Sea Scrolls would be interesting, let me know in the comments below. I think it's interesting, but I want to hear from you. Though you've probably never heard of the Essenes before this video, and though they were pretty weird, their preservation of all of these documents for us to discover two thousand years later means that their legacy is significant. So tell me, What's something that you learned in today's video about the Essenes? Let me know in the comments below because it really helps me know how to make better content for you in the future and it lets YouTube know that this is a video that they should promote. Also, if you want to know more about the discovery and impact of the Dead Sea Scrolls, let me know that too. To end each of these videos in this mini-series, I want to give some brief application to our lives based on what we learned about each group. Now, some of these were easier than others. Today, I want to talk about retreating. It can be really tempting just to throw up your hands at all the crazy that's going on in our society and decide to build a cabin out in the middle of the woods just to get away from everything. I feel that, but that's retreating from our God-given mission, and that's not what God has called us to do. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I can't help but wonder if all the people that were listening to this message live with Jesus didn't immediately think of the Essenes. Now, the Essenes, they refer to themselves as the sons of light, but isolating themselves, they were hiding the light that they claimed that they had. Jesus prayed this way, The world hates them, hates who? Hates Jesus followers, because they do not belong to this world, just as I do not belong to this world. I want you to notice this. Jesus says, I'm not asking you, asking God, to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them, notice this, into the world. Let me combine two phrases from what I just read to give you a clearer picture of what Jesus is praying. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I am sending them into the world. Christians, as Jesus followers, we are sent into the world to be the light. So to quote Jesus, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Don't shrink back. Don't hide. That's what our spiritual enemy wants us to do, to feel so discouraged and so beat up that we retreat from all relevance in our culture. Bottom line, don't retreat. Let's live sent, 
going forward in our mission to spread the good news that is Jesus. Hey, I hope you learned something in this video and that you were inspired. If you were, would you please consider sharing it? And be sure to subscribe here on YouTube so that you can catch the next Bible Tidbits video when it drops on Thursday. Before we go, I want to remind you that LifeWord has a huge catalog of Christian programming that will keep you encouraged and strengthen your faith. Times are uncertain, so if you want to listen and watch content that is biblically sound, head over to LifeWord.org because they've got that kind of content for days. We'll see you next time. Grace and peace.